three speakers and me tonight um, to uh, present a, a broad overview and also some, uh, to hone in on some of the specific aspects of the legislation and then later on we can talk about where to from here. So <clears throat> the sp first speaker is Mark Lax, who's uh, a law lecturer at QUT and he will speak on the, the Vlad and other pieces of legislation. Um, and then the next speaker will be Michael Cope, who's uh, from the president of the Civil Liberties Council of Queensland. The third speaker will be Peter Ongi, Ong, or Ongi for short, who's from the Electrical Trades Union. Um, Peter Simpson, the secretary, he's representing uh, his, his members tonight because uh, Peter Simpson uh, was called out of town. So uh, without any further ado, I'd call on Mark. Mark, Mark has a, a background in this area and will give us an overview of what's happening with the uh, bikey legislation. Okay. So cool. Thank you. A couple of clarifications. My background in the area doesn't mean I was a bikey. Um, I'm also <laughs> not a law lecturer. I'm actually just a lecturer, a lecturer in the School of Justice, not in the law school, which makes me slightly more human. No offence to my... <laughs> I have a law degree, but that doesn't count as being the same thing. So I'm going to give you a bit of a background about bikies themselves and the whole notion of what a bikie is, and a 1% or more particularly, and then we'll get on to the legislation. So I don't know how much everybody knows about the history of bikies. A lot of people have read some things, but a lot of, most people don't really know the basic history. Um, ask me any questions as I'm going along if you've got a short question. So when we're talking about the current modern form of a bikie, we're talking about groups who got together. They started in America after World War II. It was a group of guys who really missed the camaraderie, and the danger that they shared when they were in the war. And one of the other things they really enjoyed when they were in the war was riding American-made motorcycles. So the things, all these things came together. And they actually wanted to form brotherhoods. They wanted to form clubs where they would share this common experience of danger, drinking, fighting, and treating women unbelievably badly. And that was what has been maintained all the way through the history of bikies around the world. This is the theme where it came from. The fame of bikey clubs around the world actually came from stories that came out of America in the 50s and early 60s where other guys around the world said, I like that, that's me, I want to form the same club. A lot of the clubs, like the Hells Angels chapters around the world, were formed without any knowledge of the American Central Hells Angel chapter, for example. The New Zealand club was formed and was in existence for eight years before the Americans ever heard of them because they'd read about them, read about them in the newspapers and said, we love that, and they literally painted the patches on the back of leather jackets. We're actually going to do a fashion retrospective at QUT, going from Marlon Brando and the wild one all the way up to the Nike bikies, as we call them, the guys without motorcycles who have the funky haircuts, bling, and the steroids. So <laughs> it's a really, really interesting retrospective because what it actually shows you is part of this military culture is still there. The uniform and the fashion is an incredibly important part of the brotherhood association that these guys have. You don't breach the rules of dress code, ever. It's extremely important. It's a very important thing I want to come back to when we're talking about this new legislation and the way it's being policed. The military aspects of it are there in every biker club around the world because the structure of a military organisation is also there. It's what they want. It's part of the attraction. Now, a very important historical event was the Holster riots that happened in California um, it was a massive media beat up on the part of Life magazine that turned it into a bikey riot. So a complete misrepresentation of the motorcycle groups who were there. There was also another complete misrepresentation. The American Motorcycle Association said that these people who participated in this riot are not normal motorcyclists. They are outlaws. 99% of motorcyclists are law abiding citizens. It's only 1% of people who are outlaws. That's the term outlaw motorcycle gang. Outlaw motorcycle gang doesn't mean breaking the rules of society. It means breaking the rules of the American Motorcycle Association. And that's why you will see these groups who call themselves outlaw motorcycle gangs having the 1% of patch. We are the 1% who broke the rules. We're the bad boys. Now, what comes out of that culture is public disobedience. Public disobedience and causing strife and getting that public feedback, that initial feedback of you're all bad people and we don't like you. And they get off on that. Showing real class, exactly. And they want to do it, and it's part of the persona. Thus far, we're not really seeing very much law-breaking other than the way they treat the women. And 
literally gang rape is a natural part of most 1% of clubs around the world and other gang cultures as well. So we're dealing with a group of people who are highly masculine, love the brotherhood association of hanging around, especially with other men and having a dangerous lifestyle and wearing uniforms. There's another group in Queensland has that set of characteristics. <laughs> <laughs> That's an article I'm going to write. <laughs> But it literally is true, and if you studied the psychology of these two groups, you're only looking at one point of difference between the men who participate. And you often find some police who were participants in both groups. Maybe not necessarily the one percent of groups, but they were certainly in groups that were very close to being a one percent of group and also being full-time police officers. One of the office holders, I think it's Hells Angels, is a former police sergeant. So you can see this same personality type operating there. Now, what I've described is what we call the conservative bikey group. This is coming from American studies. When I say American studies, there are a grand total of six people in the world who study bikies. There are 60 people in the world who study organised crime, and that includes the PhD students. If you were studying homicide, there are 7,500 people studying homicide. Don't ask me why this is, because I find organised crime bikies 20,000 times more interesting than homicide, but that's the way <laughs> academia goes. It goes, it follows the money. So if anyone's interested in studying organised crime and bikies, come and see me because we've always got plenty of original work that you can do. The people who have done the studies in America have said that there's these two cultures. So we have the conservative bikies, who are the ones I've described, and then we have what they call the radicals. The radicals are the ones who have completely, in the meaning of the word radical, overthrown the government of the bikie chapters. And when they've overthrown it, what they've done is what most groups who formed organised crime groups have done in the past, they've said... I have a resource here of violent young men. What can I do with that? Well, I can make a hell of a lot of money. That's how the Tong chapters form. That's how the Yakuza form. That's how all of the organised crime groups formed around the world. You get a gathering of young men and you use it to intimidate. So it was a business decision. And what you then find is a shift in the government of individual chapters around the world as they move between a conservative clique running things or a radical clique running. So if you were to go over to Southampton in England, where a friend of mine studies bikies, where they have all the characteristics of the Gold Coast, you know, if you can call it that in England, it's the sun fun place to go, but it's where people go <laughs> for exactly the same reasons. They have a schoolies week, for example, and all of that sort of thing. They have a meth market. So any of the party drugs, any of the sort of things you're going to go to the Gold Coast for, you're going to go to the south of England for if you're British. They also have every single biker group, other than the Rebels and the Renegades, which are Australian inventions, there that we have. And they have zero bikey participation in the meth market and absolutely no stories of uh, street violence involving bikies because this is our suspicion. We're never going to get to go and ask them, but we appear to have a conservative clique running all the clubs in the south of England, radical cliques running clubs, at least on the Gold Coast. If you went across the channel to Holland, northern Germany, Switzerland and Sweden, they have ramped up the violence to levels way above anything we do here, where the Hells Angels actually throw bombs into nightclubs and police stations. So... It just depends. We've got a variation. But what you can see is a cultural change. And you will see a cultural change around Australia. We did a study of the police application of the Finks. Remember under the 2009 legislation, the police made an application to get the Finks named as a criminal organisation. There were 44 bikies mentioned in that. Now, all of them had some form of criminal record. But of the 44, only 18 had any offences that were serious, that were involved with extortion or drugs or something like that. The rest of them all had offences that were minor offences. Now, those minor offences can involve assault, but we're talking about conservative behaviour. We're not talking about radical behaviour. What that means is the majority of the members of the Finks, the number one group the police were targeting, were not participating in organised crime, according to the police's own data. It is very, very hard to prove that anyone's associated with organised crime anywhere, the successful RICO legislation in New York that Giuliani used, it took seven years to put, gather the data and put the prosecutions in place. That has not happened here. People have been gathering data, but they don't have the powers and they don't have the resources that the Americans have. The only club that you could actively say is directly involved in organised crime, and this is actually only data coming out of the Courier Mail, that journal of record, <laughs> is that the Silver Brothers were sending a cut of their meth money to a bank account run by one of the Hells Angels chapters. 
which once again just gets back to the point the police always say they only catch the dumb ones. Don't take the money and put it straight to our bank account. At least try and launder it before you do that. But that's the only evidence we have of the management of a club in Queensland being directly involved in organised crime. We have members of the management of the Finks who have been directly involved in organised crime. We have the Finks terror team that was openly set up as an extortion ring and had, I think, a maximum of seven members out of the 44, and that membership changed over time. So what we're not seeing is a criminal organisation, as in every member of the organisation participating in the criminal activity that the politicians are claiming. We're seeing an organisation within an organisation. Now, let's look at what other organisations in the world operate that way. How many politicians have been involved in corruption in New South Wales in the last 10 years? <laughs> Possibly not all, but perceptively maybe. We've proven that there is a significant group of politicians in New South Wales who really showed the Queenslanders how to carry out corruption. The Queenslanders were amateurs. And by the logic that we're running, this can be a named organisation. You could name the ALP in New South Wales as a criminal organisation under the Queensland legislation. Here's another organisation where a significant group of people within that organisation have been involved in organised crime. That was the licensing branch that operated in Queensland from 1953 to 1986. I can now name another organisation under the legislation as being a criminal organisation because, under the same logic, it contains a group of people who are carrying out organised crime. It's a bad point of logic. It's a logical fallacy of composition. Composition is where you say, I see one part of a group has a characteristic, therefore everybody in that group has the same characteristic. However, that's what the legislation is. So we moved to 2009 when Queensland was responding to the South Australian legislation. One thing we know from organised crime studies is when a certain jurisdiction makes tough laws and the others don't, it's a business decision. We're taking our business where it's easier to conduct business. South Australia brought in tough laws. All the other states had to bring in the same laws or, as was actually happening, the bikies went to those states. 2009 legislation in Queensland, if you want to see everything that is wrong with the current law, you need to look at the LNP's comments during the 2009 debate. They are excellent. They are, they are a masterwork in pointing out human rights and everything is wrong with this sort of criminal association legislation. They seem to have forgotten it, but at the time the ALP that were in government were yelling out, you're just friends of bikies. That legislation didn't name bikies either. It was all criminal legislation, criminal organisation legislation. After that, they come into government and try to prove they're not friends of bikies. And they brought in tougher legislation. I don't know if anyone's read the Hansard. I'm only one of the few idiots in the world that reads Hansard and enjoys it. No one else does. It's actually fascinating. I love it. Um, Ali, when I mentioned. <laughs> well, you might get mentioned again now. <laughs> not one single politician in Queensland raised any human rights issues during that debate, except for one member of the United Australia Party didn't like the fact that his friends could not associate. So, not the ALP, not Wellington, not Cunningham, virtually no one in the UAP was opposed to this legislation on any civil liberties grounds whatsoever. In fact, the ALP's opposition to the legislation was that ours was better. Your tough, crazy, bikey legislation is as good as our tough, crazy, bikey legislation. Right? So that's where we currently stand with this legislation. It does not name bikies in there. Now, we have a lot of theories as to why this is the case. I, I actually don't place a lot of trust in the intelligence of politicians. I worked in Premier's Department. I worked in Justice Department. I've known a lot of politicians. My first job, I was delivering the mail to Joe when he was still there as Premier. I don't actually think they're deep thinkers. So I don't place a lot of faith in conspiratorial ideas. I actually think they're doing this for votes. Um, it will work. It's extremely popular on the Gold Coast. You only need to talk to anyone who lives on the Gold Coast and they think it's wonderful. So I, I, the thing that really amazes me is, I don't know if anyone's watched any news from New South Wales, anything on you know, cable TV or anything. They're not getting a full story. They actually see this as a terrific piece of legislation. Finally, we have decisive politicians. They're not seeing the human rights issue at all because no one's really raising it in the media. There's not much opposition in the general media because how many people actually read the comment sections of 
you know, the newspapers, the commentary sections, not that many. Yes, most people here, but most people out there don't. So most people down south are unaware of what the issues with the legislation are. They just see it as finally someone's taken decisive action against bikie gangs. My theory of this is based also upon the fact that if you were talking about organised crime groups other than bikie gangs, the legislation doesn't work too well. How do you name a group that doesn't have a name? So if it was myself and the six people in the front row here who were all together running a car rebirthing operation, we're an organised crime group under any definition of any legislation in the world. But we don't have a name. Birthing operation. Yeah, <laughs> that's after we get arrested. <laughs> But how do we have a name? How do we get named under this legislation? This legislation doesn't mention bikies, but it's very, very tied. The processes within it are tied to particular sorts of organisations like outlaw motorcycle clubs. So that's my personal suspicion that it's a very short-term vote-grabbing reinforcement of um, normal conservative, well, law and order politics, which in Queensland isn't necessarily conservative anymore. Okay, right, any questions? Yeah, Quickly yeah. for me, yeah. <laughs> Well, it's a it's a Any questions about civil It's not yes, but you know it's not a sunset clause. It, the the legislation a, doesn't go away. So under a sunset right. clause, the legislation dies unless it's renewed. Under here, we're just going to review it's it. It's a review. That's yeah. right. And every everyone is there using that to celebrate. Oh, oh, oh not the concern about yeah. civil liberty in three years' time we'll see. Yeah. Well, most of the Australians, I don't know about three years anyway. No. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, there's another side to it too. Um, why are we doing this legislation in this way with no application to a court? Because it's virtually impossible well, to prove the existence of a criminal organisation to the standard that a court will require. It's also a constitutional. Oh, well, that's going to all come out very soon. Yeah, isn't it? Sorry. Yeah, we're yeah, we're, we're going to leave that? Yeah, we, we'll, we'll, we'll have all the speakers and then we'll have an okay. hour for discussion. So, well, well, we got on time. Yeah, yeah no, no, we're ready for our next speaker. Good, if you're I'll ready sit down. <laughs> 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 so, we'd just like to make a note of the points you'd like to raise. After you've heard all the speakers. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So, uh, Michael Cope. Introduce um, from the oh, podium, sorry. Just, just so the camera can work. Oh, sorry. So our next speaker is Michael Cope, who's the president of the Queensland Council for Civil Liberties. Thank you, Michael. Good evening. Thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, we we live in a state. To, this sort of legislation is not new. So here we have a history of authoritarian legislation in the state going back most of the century, really. I mean, Joe Bioki Peterson learnt all his tricks from the previous Labor governments. So this is a piece which has been going on for a long time. Um, this legislation, it's not quite true to say the legislation doesn't mention bikies. There's a series of pieces of legislation. There's what's called the Vlad Act, which certainly doesn't mention bikies. But the Criminal Organisation Disruption Act does. It mentions them. there's a schedule of them. There's 26 of them named. But they're not mentioned anywhere in the operative parts of the Act, which means that any organisation can any day be added by regulation to the back of the Act and become subject to the legislation. So whichever way you look at it, it's legislation that can be applied to any person in Queensland at any time by fiat of the executive. From the civil liberties point of view, we test legislation by reference to four principles. Is it necessary? Is it reasonable? Is it justified? And is it proportionate? On the question of whether it's necessary, we note that the Crime and Misconduct Commission in its report published in September 2013 mentioned bikies three times in 122 pages. It made a comment that it was considering what measures might be needed to deal with bikies, but didn't seem to suggest that we needed urgent legislation in the next month or two. We note that the, uh, as a result of the incident on the Gold Coast, some 18 people have been charged, much in the same way as some 15 individuals were eventually convicted as a result of the incident in Sydney, which started this rash of legislation. The fact that the law is broken does not mean the law is a failure. We have a law against murder. The fact that murder still occurs does not mean the law has failed. If people are, are, are commit offences, they should be charged and tried and sentenced as required if they are convicted. Also, as has already been noted, 
The Queensland Government, the past one and the present one, have recently passed a whole series of bits of legislation giving the police a whole new range of powers. The Queensland Police only got wiretapping powers about four years ago. They introduced the criminal organisation legislation by government in 2009. For reasons best known to the police, the first case on that legislation was started in June last year. It went to the High Court, and the High Court dismissed that challenge on the 14th of March this year. And that case was, presuming it's still going, to, going ahead, I don't know, set down for hearing for about four weeks, coming up, I think, early next year. The government also passed what it calls unexplained wealth laws, which give the government extraordinary powers to require people to explain where they got their money from. Sort of legislation you might, you know, ask people like Rupert Murdoch where they got their money from, <laughs> but I don't think it's intended to be used against them. <laughs> but um, we, we haven't um, we haven't seen whether those laws um, have worked yet. That we now see this have this necessity for a whole bunch of other more extraordinary pieces of legislation. So even if assuming that. Uh, the laws could be demonstrated to be necessary, which we don't accept. The next question is, are they reasonable? Are they proportionate? What the laws do is violate one of the fundamental principles upon which our legal system has worked for the last 200 years, which is that you should be punished for what you've done, not for what you might do or with whom you associate. If you, if Once you violate those principles, then the risk that innocent persons will be uh, caught up in the legislation is inevitable. There is no doubt it will occur. And in fact, of course, it has already occurred. It has occurred with the poor character who was wearing the Sons of Anarchy T-shirt. <laughs> We've had the police now announce that uh, if you are a, a biker, they perhaps want me to call them, and want to go to, for a Sunday afternoon ride in a group, you should ring them up and tell them <laughs> that you're going so that, uh, you know, you don't get pulled over, which is an extraordinary Ordinary people going about their Sunday afternoon, Sunday morning business lawfully are required to inform the police where they are going and what they are doing. I, I did an interview with a, uh, the head, or we may not be quite the head, but I think he was the head of the Vietnam Veterans uh, bike, bike Group from Queensland, and uh, he was quite astonished as he was asking me and the interviewer, what are they supposed to do when other you know, bikies come along to their meetings. Uh, you know, are they supposed to throw them out because they might be bad people and therefore get them all locked up? And he was also particularly perplexed about, you know, whether he was required to ring up the police when he wanted to go down to the shop on a Sunday morning. <laughs> so these, these are not the sort of people that you would think uh, would normally be uh, upset with the current government, but there they are. And it's actually a piece, as I think Margaret was pointing, you know, we're getting all these sporting comments from you know, um, car enthusiasts in uh, Ipswich and these sort of places, you would not normally associate with being supporters of the Council for Civil Liberties. But they see this very much as part of a whole range of legislation which has been introduced, particularly by this government, uh, dealing with hoons, in inverted commas. Um, I'll just give you a, a couple of scenarios and the way, particularly the VLAD Act, as it's known, uh, works. Um, and, and these are all examples which are open under the legislation. Uh, you are a member of the bowls or a golf club. You get involved in a scuffle trying to throw out a misbehaving member of the club. You are convicted of wounding, which simply requires that the skin is broken, that some blood comes out. You could be jailed for an extra 15 years because you have engaged, you have wounded that person whilst participating in the activities of an association, namely the golf club. You are... A, the legislation has an interesting provision in the schedule which does actually refer to trade unions. It's not quite clear why it's in there, because it's a bit out. I mean, we can understand why it's there, but it's, it's, it's just there all by itself. There's no other related provisions, but obviously so it's there. Bikey, bikey trade unions. Yeah, that's it. Outlaw bikey trade unions. That's it. So it's, you know, and, and as I said, you know, in the Organisation Bill, uh, Organisation Act, people just be listed by, 
display to cabinet any day of the week, so it doesn't really matter. Um, and as I mentioned, and this is relevant to the sort of left, uh, current enthusiast people who are talking to us, you know, you're a member of the, the Commodore Club and uh, you're out at a meeting and you have a burnout and the coppers come along and arrest you, you could also be charged with a Vlad Act offence because you've committed the criminal offence whilst participating in an association, namely the Commodore Car Club. And the choice as to whether or not you get the extra 15 years is made by the police and the prosecution. It's one of the uh, things about these sort of these this sort of legislation is that it transfers the power to make these decisions as to sentence from the court back to the executive, because you will get the extra 15 years only if the police or the prosecution decide to charge you. And of course, what that means is, and perhaps I'll come back to this later on if I get time. Oh, it's next thing and thing. It, it, this is what happened with the consorting legislation which was introduced around the country in the, in the 30s and the 40s. This was legislation which basically made an offence to associate with known criminals. And it was introduced as a result of a media beat up really in the 20s and the 30s. It, it was opposed by that notable civil, civil libertarian Jack Lang. And he opposed it on the correct basis which he said was that it would be abused by the police. And how did the police use it? The police would say to people, if you don't cop to this, or you don't give us this information, you don't assist in this way, we will charge you with consorting. And it was repealed because numerous royal commissions found that it was the root of police corruption. And so the same thing is likely to happen with this. The police are going to use it as a tool for obtaining information and for pressing people to plead guilty to other offences with the threat that if they uh, don't go along with the idea, they'll get the extra 15 or if they're uh, high up in the organisation, the 25 years. So this is where this sort of legislation strikes at the very root of the rule of law because it encourages um, the shifting of discretion away from the courts and into the executive, and the abuse of that discretion will inevitably follow. At the Council, we um, do not think it's appropriate for people to refer to us and those who oppose the legislation as apologists for paedophiles or supporters of bikies. Equally, it's wrong to say that those who disagree with us are rednecks. And in fact, the most telling illustration of the fact that people do understand these principles and when, it, when they have all the information is what's known as the Tasmanian jury study, where jurors in Tasmania were asked, who'd sat on juries, were asked to comment on the sentence imposed by the judge. 90% of them considered the sentence imposed by the judge to be appropriate. They knew all the facts. Unlike most people in the public, they don't get the half-assed Courier mail version, which usually just states what the prosecution says and puts the worst possible light on it. People who are fully informed do understand these, uh, these issues. On a broader point, um, really, this well, the Premier has made it clear that um, one of the issues behind all of this is, of course, the drug trade. And the war on drugs has been the source of most of the major infringements of civil liberties uh, in the last 40 years. Really, if we really want to get to the heart of the problem of dealing with organised crime, we need to end the war on drugs and end the prohibition on drugs. <laughs> Moreover, it is extraordinary from a government which is so dedicated to cutting costs that it wants to lock up more people. I think I read that it already locked up more than 900 extra people. And it's clear, for, you know, in the United States where they've been doing this sort of stuff for at least 40 or 50 years. But what happens is that jails are overcrowded. Even things like recently in the West, when the Western Australian government changed, they appointed a new person to the parole board. 
who took a new view of how parole should be given out, which is that no one should get it, and now they have a problem that their jails are full. And it's gotten so bad in the United States that in California, the Supreme Court there has held that California jails are so overcrowded that it amounts to cruel and unusual punishment and breach of their Bill of Rights, and it's ordered the California government to release them, or a number of them. The California government keeps on appealing and finding reasons not to do that. But inevitably, that is what is going to happen here. We're supposed to be saving money. Really, what this is, is a political device for uh, rein trying to re-establish the, pop the popularity of the government. It is a political device, unfortunately, of all colours of government. Um, it is also a useful cover for other measures, such as the, uh, the change to the workers' compensation legislation, which was introduced the same week and dealt with in the same extraordinarily quick fashion, with no review, no comment, and no justification. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, our next speaker is Peter Ong, who's a senior organiser with the Electrical Trades Union, uh, mainly to speak about the, the workers' comp aspect. Cheers, comrades. Um, my name's Peter Ong. I'm the Assistant Secretary of the Electrical Trades Union and um, I've been an organiser for that outfit for the last 14 years. Um, as unionists in this state, we've seen, uh, obviously, what we do, we, we work fairly effectively to look after workers um, in whatever shape or form we can achieve what we're trying to achieve. And over the last 14 years, I've seen governments try and introduce legislation to stop us from doing what we, uh, what we do well. Um, I was dragged through the Coal Royal Commission in 2001 um, and pasted as a thug and a meathead and an extortionist um, for doing my job. $60 million was spent of taxpayers' money, which is workers' money, was spent on the Coal Royal Commission, and the outcome of that Coal Royal Commission was to introduce the whole idea of the Coal Royal Commission was to introduce the ABCC, which is the Australian Building and Construction Commission, which was a police force set up outside of the normal realms of the law to deal specifically with construction workers in our industry, to the point where uh, they introduced laws that said, uh, if you engage in any illegal industrial action, you are deemed or you can be um, dragged in uh, in front of the in front of the chamber of the ABCC and you will be interrogated and you must give evidence to that commission you do not have the right to legal representation and uh, if you refuse to uh, give evidence in that commission then you face only one only one penalty and that's six months in jail no fine six months in jail was it and the last one uh, that went through it that you probably would be aware of was Arc Tribe. Now, under a Labor government, um, Arc Tribe was, you know, eventually dismissed and there were no, no charges uh, pending against Arc. But have a look at that $60 million of workers' money, taxpayers' money spent on a Royal Commission that toured the country with, and as we all know, any Royal Commission, they don't have a Royal Commission without knowing the outcome straight off. And their outcome was simply to introduce the ABCC. And they introduced the ABCC because we had an ability to achieve what we had to achieve for workers without builders coming back at us and introducing the penalties that were already there. But because of the effect, I guess, or the, the influence we had on builders if they tried to introduce those penalties, they needed a third party. Because if the builders did they uh, tried to, to in, uh, attack us with those penalties and there might have been some form of retribution against those bills, right? So they introduced a third party being the ABCC. We couldn't get at them. We couldn't use our influence against them. They could then attack us and find workers and unions and all the rest of it. And they would reduce our ability to do what we did. That was in 2001. As unions, 
we don't always operate within the industrial law, okay? We're, we're all legal abiding citizens, law-abiding citizens, right? But occasionally um, legislation or law is introduced that we can't work within. How can you do your fucking job in, uh, within some of the laws that are introduced against us? It just does not... It's, it won't work. We can't do that. So at some point in time, we are always going to be outside of that legislation and we are going to always be lawless associations, OK? Because we are an association. We're a trade union, we're an association. And if we're deemed to be outside of the legislation, then we're lawless to that uh, legislation, which is our major concern with what's being introduced with the VLAD Act. Um, you all would have seen when, uh, I think it was about, shit, it was only a few weeks after Campbell Newman, Newman um, got into power, I had a call from our comrades down at Musgrave Park. Um, we had, um, the guys were just trying to uphold the, the sovereignty camp down there. We had, uh, they had rung us and said, look, we've been approached by the council. Um, they believe that we've got uh, an issue with... Um, what do they call it? The the Paniiri Festival, oh, yeah. the Paniiri Festival, right? And we have a, a an issue with uh, where your camp is, and uh, and the Paniiri Festival being um, which goes on. So I said no worries. I went down, had a chat to them, and we said, well, delineation between the two was their was their main issue. So I spoke to a couple of contractors, and we got a fence put around the whole thing so that we could delineate the sovereignty camp from the Paniiri Festival. As soon as, we, as soon as we did that, as soon as we put a fence around the whole thing, it went from, OK, we've asked you to leave, but we're not going too hard, to, oh, my God, they're, they're encamping, they're putting up barriers, this is getting serious. And the very next day after we put that fence up, we had 800 coppers. 800 fucking jacks marched into Musgrave Park to remove... What, 45 people are in, around a fire? It was an absolute disgrace, and I couldn't believe it. I mean, they shut down the whole of... It, it wasn't Maryvale Street. What's the one that runs down past Musgrave Park? Uh, 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 main, the, the main street in Brisbane. I mean, the traffic that comes down there is enormous. And it was, it was fairly ominous when... Uh, it was about 5 o'clock in the morning, and all the traffic just stopped. Yeah. I mean, what the hell's going on here? And... Then all these jacks just started marching into Musgrave Park. 800 coppers and the people observing it was... We went, holy fuck. Campbell Newman's been in power for three weeks. This, this is what we're in for. This is what we're in for. And everyone said, this is Joe. This is the Joe era back again. And um, if Campbell Newman is not um, Joe reincarnated, I don't know what's happening. But I'll stick to the point. The Vlad Act in... Uh, as the guys have mentioned already, in, at no part in the Vlad Act does it mention bikers. It, it mentions lawless associations. Well, as I just said, we are an association. We're a, an association that looked a, looks after electricians, looks after workers. And as I just mentioned, at any time we can be in breach of legislation because that's how we do our job. Pe uh, governments introduce legislation to stop us from doing our job because... We do it fairly well. And when they introduce a legislation, obviously we, we build a strategy to work around that legislation, however, however we do it. But unfortunately, we're outside of the law when we do that. We've got day in, day out, we're currently having a blue with John Hollands. And we're doing it illegally under the legislation. So as a officer of the Electrical Trades Union, who's in breach of the current legislation outside of the law I'm facing what what is it guys 20 grand 25 years 25 years as an officer of the ETU on a picket line when I've been ordered to stop that picket line or my workforce has been ordered my members have been ordered to return to work they're in breach of the legislation and they're taking illegal industrial action that means they face 15,000 uh, 15 years in jail. I keep going for money because that's what we're used to. I can't believe that we're now talking 
time in jail. 15 years in jail for a member of my union who uh, has... Such at the moment that one small collective of you is, um, don't insist what you've been told is exist, then everybody in the organisation is proscribed at the same time. Proscribed. So no one in the union can collect the wine debt. The, the moment a handful break the law, like what you described, mm. the moment six get told, stop the ticket, and you refuse to stop it, the whole organisation is proscribed yeah, from there. Let's take this up in discussion. Yeah. Well, we'll, have, we'll have a good yarn. We'll have a good yarn afterwards, but fucking Neve lost me train of thought. You know. <laughs> so I'll try and get back to it. But I guess, I guess for us, we, as a trade union, we are used to governments coming in and legislating against us. Because as soon as we work out a strategy to beat their legislation, they're going to change the legislation. So um, this this is is really scary to us because. You know, they've gone for bikers, and it's the same as any other minority. If you want to introduce a harsh law, um, go the redneck, go the redneck popularity vote, okay, and, and attack an association that doesn't have a great following. Bikers, as our comrade said earlier on, bikers, drug, drug dealers, fucking rapists, fucking murderers, everyone goes, Oh, yeah, fuck them dirty, filthy bikers. Does anyone read the law? No, they just go, yeah, yeah, that's great. Let's go the bikers. And this, I don't think there's any... I, I know my comrade down the end there said they're not smart enough to do it, but and he's probably right because most of them are fucking half-wits, but <laughs> I, I just can't get over the fact that they, they've introduced such a harsh law as the Vlad Act and they have targeted bikers for a reason because most people will not stand up against it. And the populist vote is, yeah, them dirty, filthy bikers. No one's going to come out and go, we support the, the bikers. This is a bullshit law attacking the bikers. But not once in that law is bikers mentioned. It's a lawless association. And as I've just said to you, I'm a lawless association every time I step outside of the legislation that covers industrial relations, which for me and every one of my organisers is uh, a day-to-day -day thing. We, we cannot do our job with inside the industrial relations laws at the moment. So that means we're a lawless association and we face exactly the same penalties as uh, what they're trying to swoo the public with and get this law, well, they can do it anyway. What, what I really like, our comrades from the Law Association, because I'm no lawyer and I lawyer and I, I haven't got a great understanding of law, I've got a great understanding of breaking the law, but um, you know, I mean how does this sit with the Westminster Society, uh, or with the mess Westminster fucking <laughs> <laughs> That's it, that's what I mean all of that, you know, I mean, come on I just, honestly, I've got to, I've got to wind up, because I'm getting the wind up and I had all these things to talk to you about but we can talk about that later, but but um, I just can't believe that people are being led like this and, and we have to do something about it and we've got to build a movement against it. And it's been done before. I mean, we, uh, Joe introduced uh, more than what? Four people? Three. Three people? More than three people is a gathering and that's illegal. This prick's doing the same thing. It's time that we, uh, people actually started getting off their asses and uh, actually see what's going on and not being fooled by biker laws. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ongi. Um, I'd just like to start off by saying... Um, that, that um, it's quite clear that this whole rash of legislation, and we've mostly been uh, concentrating on the Vlad Act, but there's a whole sheaf of them. There's, well, there's the Tattoo Parlours Bill and the <coughs> amendments to the criminal law, uh, law criminal <coughs> the criminal law amendment bill. There's also stuff in relation to the G20, which is coming up 
next year. Um, the Dangerous Sex Offenders Bill, where you know the um, the minister can be the jury, judge, executioner, etc. You know, executive powers can actually incarcerate someone for life just on the uh, possibility that he he may, he may offend. And then, of course, the changes to the Workers' Compensation Act. That is one that wasn't rushed through. It was rushed through in the end, but um, there was 12 months of, of uh, a parliamentary committee actually reviewing it. And they, at the end of that, they decided that uh, it was quite a good compensation system that we had in Queensland and didn't need to be changed. But they've gone ahead anyway. But all of these laws, they're not about making our community safe. It's about strengthening the state against its citizens, basically. It's, it's about subverting freedom of association. It's about uh, using executive powers to politically intervene. Um, the government can politically intervene in, 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 in the lives of its citizens. Political control, stifling dissent and social protest movements and trade unions. Um, it's really not about bikies at all, even though that's the, the, the pretext. Um, and also not to mention the attack on individual civil liberties, not just associations. I had a look at a couple of um, uh, statutes or, or uh, incorporation uh, constitutions of some bikey organisations, and when I looked at them, they really didn't look that much different from a lot of other organisations. It, it, just, it just looked like they... I know, I know when I've been involved in setting up organisations in my work as a community worker, you get a template from the the um, the, the, the state go the government body the the the, 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 co the companies thing, and they're all pretty much the same. They all say the same sort of guff. Um, so really, yeah, you know, any association is a threat. And as a member of a socialist organisation, when you look at what our aims and objectives are, they're far more dangerous than anything that the bikies are on about. <laughs> we actually want to replace the state. Um, so, you know, you can see, see where, the, where, where that's going. Um, so, I mean, basically, it, it extends to any group of, of, what, three or more persons by whatever name called, whether associated formally or informally, whether the group is legal or illegal. So, you know, that's, that, that's pretty amazing. And the, the attack is extended to other areas, as I mentioned. Um, introduced in relation to the G20 summit that's going to be held in Brisbane next year. I was just thinking when Ong Ying was talking about the uh, the 800, you know, the cops that uh, demolished uh, the the sovereign tent embassy at Musgrave Park. Well, I mean, that's you can imagine, and that's just on the edge of the proclaimed area. Um, we'll be seeing a hell of a lot more action there, with the extension of the police powers that they've got under under this legislation, and we're have a commercial for, an, for some organising that's going to be happening at the weekend to start the plan for that. Um, the Dangerous Sex Offenders Bill allows the Attorney General to recommend indefinite jail for serious sex offenders, in effect declaring, the, as I said, the government, the judge, jury and executioner. Um, the, 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 the tough on crime crackdown was supported by the Labor opposition, as uh, Mark mentioned, and it's received overwhelming media support. Um, it appeals to a perceived fear within the community whipped up by the media that criminal bikey gangs and pedophiles pose a real danger to the community and can only be dealt with by these tough laws. Well, you know, there are enough laws already to cover those sorts of things, as, as, as the previous speakers have said. And the real solution to the social problems that, that they're supposed to be targeting lies in, in targeting the causes, not restricting civil liberties. Legalising the manufacture, distribution and use of marijuana and other recreational drugs would stop the lucrative activity of so-called criminal bikey gangs or, or individuals involved, not to mention police corruption. Um, as uh, Michael already said, you know, th he could see these laws just being a, a, a way of... of, of uh, creating more corrupt cops, just as overcrowding of jails and the, 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 all this, the stuff about, you know, 23 hours in solitary confinement in a special um, maximum security prison in pink pyjamas or, or overalls or whatever. That, you know, how, 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 we're going to have a really, a really peaceful prison population, you know, I think. You know, it's, it's, it's just 
stimulating um, violence. Um, so what, you know, I think, I think these laws, most unjust laws need to be taken on. I think, we, you know, they, 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 they need to be challenged, they need to be taken on, they need to be repealed. And for that to happen, uh, and, and the government sh funding should be increased for community and mental health and drug and alcohol services which address the real problems. Um, and as has been alluded to, what we do need is a broad mass movement akin to what existed during the repressive Bjorki Peterson era to fight these attacks on civil liberties. And I th would suggest that such a movement would combine community groups, trade unions, students, churches, academics, the legal fraternity, civil liberties activists, political parties, resident action groups, bowling clubs, as you mentioned, uh, and, and whoever. But I think what we've got to realise, though, too, is that, that uh, you know, it's very clever, I suppose, that they're targeting bikies and pedophiles. I mean, they're, they're, no one really um, wants to uh, be seen to be supporting, you know, criminals, particularly criminals who uh, attack children. Um, but really, I think what we've got to realise is that these are laws which basically attack freedom of association and also uh, allow the, the, the government to have m exert more control, bypassing the judiciary, but bypassing, well, the, the latest is that the, the law was tested and now they've, you know, tinkered with it and changed it, you know, appealed the Supreme Court, oh, we've got the law wrong, we'll just have to, you know, insert another clause and uh, because of, of, of the, what was happening with um, the bail conditions in relation to people who were former members of, of uh, these organisations. And now, and, and you know, so they're getting around that. Um, $1 million I, I, and a half been spent on an advertising campaign. That's right. Oh, we've been seeing $1 it on television. Dollars to, to, to say that they're drawing a hard line on bikies. And I think we, sh we, well, we need to draw a hard line ourselves and say that when you know that the, the majority you know uh, but i think we've got we've got we've got a challenge ahead of us because of the the media support and the underlying uh sentiment particularly as you mentioned in areas of the gold coast because people are being sold a pup they you know they and they they're being fed a lot of misinformation um you know the, the, all of these people that were uh involved in that fracas the gold coast a few months ago they're, they could be dealt with anyway. I've had a punch on similar with the same numbers in the ballot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shit happens occasionally. Yeah. So, <laughs> there there for that. I think we, I might, I might just finish up there, um, and also in closing to say that the the union movement is mobilising. How much it will mobilise, I don't know. But there is a rally next Tuesday outside Parliament House, um, and would urge everyone to attend, um, and hope that that's the beginning of a, a broader campaign which brings together all of us, basically, and, pe and people who aren't in this room to challenge this, these unjust laws and have them repealed and have the, the um, you know, put pay to, to this repressive regime that we're starting to see. Thank you. Well, I, I, I think that the the sex offenders legislation will take five minutes for the High Court to get rid of. In okay. fact, it's written on that basis. And, yeah, it's got sections in the back of it which are written on the basis that it will be found unconstitutional, and it will be. The other stuff, I think they will have great difficulty. We, we don't have a Bill of Rights. The, 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 legis the other bikey legislation excuse me if I get technical here, the other bikey legislation was struck down because there's a principle which says that the, the Parliament can't interfere with the integrity of the judiciary and the other legislation did things like, well, which is, this is why the sex offender legislation will be struck down because the South Australian bikey legislation put all these powers in the hands of the Attorney General and there basically the court was just a cipher so the High Court didn't like that. And the one in, um, in the New South Wales um, things with the burden to proof change created presumptions anyway once again because because it interfered with the way the judiciary did things the high court struck that down but all of this stuff is all being done by the parliament it's be, they are just part, putting these things in the back of legislation and and the state constitution has no 
it, it's it's even the our state constitution is like the British constitution. It basically the parliament can do what it likes. No, it has to have hang a on, hang on, hang on. There, 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 there is some there is some yeah. limit. Well, I don't know. There, there are some limits which come enough. from which are the principles that come from what's called the cable case, which is but beyond that. Um, the, the constitution, the, the, there's, the, there's no basis in the state constitution for striking down legislation. Um, so, um, the, um, so yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't think the bikies have, I mean, you know, there may be some people who can think of more clever arguments than I can, but I don't see the bikies will be able to um, strike legislation. What, down what they'll do is the sort of thing they're doing at the moment where they got up on Friday because the, the court said, well, the legislation is in fact not retrospective, and so therefore, if you've gotten out of the organisation and you could demonstrate that, which apparently they did on the police evidence, um, you'll be fine. Now, the Attorney General, which I forgot to mention, wants to make it retrospective or whatever he wants to do with it, I'm not quite sure. Um, well, it's law on the run, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, so, um, well, that's right, this is what, he, he didn't even get his own objective, which is what happens when you write legislation in two weeks. Um, although I suspect this has been sitting in a drawer in the police in the police department for years, but um, but um, but yeah, I, I actually apart you know apart from turning up and doing the usual lawyer thing and trying to get the judge to read legislation down, which many of them will be prepared to do, it's not it's not going to I don't think it's going to be found unconstitutional, not the most of it. Mm, that's scary. Sure. That would be you. Um, it seems to be. Exactly what, how, how do you think these laws will relate to the G20 laws? And do you think that these laws will be used against various groups to participate in G20? Oh, well, it's possible. I mean, it, it, riot is is included as is, is one of the offences in the back of the Vlad Act. And, I mean, that's 12 people damaging property which, of course, would be an association uh, for the purposes of the Vlad Act. So, I mean, it's, it's open to charge people with, so they get an extra 15 years. Um, so, I mean, as I said before, all of these things depend upon, you know, what the coppers want to do and what the prosecution wants to do. I mean, if they charge people with right and they convict them, they can also add this on top of it. Um, but I mean, you know, the G20 laws are pretty bad as they are anyway. I mean, you know, um, guys, guys, that they, one meeting, one meeting. they, um, I don't know that they really need to, but you know, it, it's an option. What will be really interesting to see is whether they take action with people who aren't in the precinct. So if they take action outside the precinct against people who will come into the precinct, that'll be a big step on from what they've done overseas. So overseas, the action's all taking place within the, the designated area. And it's very, very rare that you see them go to a place like this, for example, to start preempting the activity that will happen in the G20. Yeah, although the commissioner does have a power to declare... No, no that's right. No, I'm just saying, areas, whether, they take, they... whether they take the policy decision to actually do that will be a... Yeah. Well, I say interesting from an academic point of view. It won't be much fun down here if they did do it, but I'm... No. <laughs> Can I just say something about organised crime? Sorry, as an organised crime guy, um, organised crime is really bad. Um, organised crime isn't going to go away if we legalise drugs. Let's legalise drugs. I'm all for it. But if you legalise drugs, you've got to understand organised crime are in it for the money. They're not in it for the drugs. So whatever you have that is an illicit product or a service, they're going to provide you with. We're never going to legalise child sex. We're never going to legalise a whole raft of other things. If you want to make a whole lot of money right now, go to the Philippines, fill up a shipping container full of chop chop, raw tobacco. It'll cost you 10, 20,000. Bring it to Australia, you'll sell it for 2 million. Absolutely. And that's what organised crime do. Organised crime are in it for the money. So when we legalise drugs, we're not eliminating organised crime. We're eliminating a very profitable aspect of organised crime. Not but everyone wants to grow hooter either. So no, no, well, that's right. But I mean, so you can legalise it, it's and a lot still of people, going to be a market. And these guys who are in these clubs who are involved in organised crime are really, really horrible people. Let's arrest them, and yes, we definitely have the laws to arrest them, but they are horrible people. They will kill you, they will rape you, they will break your legs and shoot your dog. They will maim your children. These are not nice people. But this legislation isn't addressed 
to that. There's this laws is not to organised crime it. legislation. This is a completely different animal altogether. It does nothing to stop organised crime. It removes one participant in the organised crime illicit economy. Their role will be taken over by other people very, very quickly. Probably immediately. Yeah. I've got the resolution as uh, this meeting uh, tonight calls for a community campaign meeting to organise a broad-based community campaign to fight these laws. Good. Good. Thank you.